It's produced by a red from blue blood. Yes, Vivek. And you are one of the speakers, will just let me connect my head. Yes, take a look. Uh, Kirti Puraga or Adam Key can be taken to Richard and Adam joined. Adam Machi, I am admitting Kirti also. Okay. Yeah, right, admit her, right? Right. Rajendra Parke. Hello, Manish. How are you? Absolutely fine, Adam. How do you do? Oh, uh, very well, very well. We've got um, we've got a very nice cotton crop coming along at the moment. So um, yeah, we're very excited. That's so nice to know. Yes, more cotton, more uh, you know, trade, more more income for the farmers, more options. Uh, yes. yes, yes, yes. It's always... oh, there's still a bit to go, but it's um, yeah, I opened a few crops up with some farmers last week, and uh, oh, the, you know, just yeah, they're loaded up. They look wonderful. So yeah, it's um, it's always exciting when you get out and high yielding. Yeah, up for the new season, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's uh, it's wonderful. So yeah, so no, no, it's really nice to see you and. And um, and Richard's been helping us to make sure we've got some some good people to come over to um to visit you at the end of this month. Derek, we can't wait to welcome you and escort you, you know, in India for the Bharat Tax and then to some Indian farms where you will have a yes. first hand uh, uh, view of the farms and we'll be meeting some progressive farmers also, some tribal farmers also, some women farmers also. Wonderful! Can't wait. Uh, that'll be uh, that'll be so exciting. Yes, yeah, so I yeah. I can't uh, I can't thank um, well you enough for helping organise the itinerary and Richard, uh, you know, well both of you because um, this is a this is a very exciting thing for myself and our chairman Nigel, you know, who is a, a farmer. He's going to come and and um, we think um, uh, Renee, who's coming as well. He's a specialist in ginning and processing and yarn and and that. So we've We've got the farming and the ginning and the processing covered with um with the people that are coming. Wow. We we might, if we get the opportunity, we will take you to one ginning factory, which has been started by a farmer producer organization. So right. cooperative right. has started a ginning factory. We will try and you know incorporate that within the program. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I and I'm also going to try when we're at uh, Baratex to um to uh, meet up with some of the people from Better Cotton. Because I think they're based in um, Delhi, so um, I hope they're coming along to the um, to Baratex themselves. Very. I mean, most of them would be there for the Baratex, but if you yes. if you can get some spare some time in the evening, we can have some uh, individual meetings also. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Well, and Richard has been after it uh, since last week. We have been discussing this, you know, uh, in uh, that what can be the best outcome of your visit. Uh, using every opportunity that we get, every hour that we get with you and your team, uh, how do we utilize that and optimize, you know, the prospects of long-term engagement? Ah, uh, that's wonderful, wonderful. And I see we've got um, uh, Dr. Banj on. I think you might have met Dr. Banj, who was the researcher of the year, gave our our last webinar. And I think um, our guest speaker's on too, isn't she? Um, Kavina might be um, might be on. Who else is there, Vivek? Hello, Dr. Banj, how do you do? You are on mute right now. Yeah, can you guys? Yeah. yeah. I think, uh, yeah, we can hear you, Kavina. But can you see me? Can't see you yet. Yes, Dr. Kavina, can hear you, but would love to see you. Uh, just a second. I'll jump in and say hello, Manish. Nice to see you again. Same here, Dr. Banj. How are the, how are the uh, cotton crops you've been looking at, uh, Mike? Um, uh, I'm just telling Manish that I saw some last week that I just oh they're just fantastic. What about what are you look what are you seeing? Uh, similarly, Adam. You know the weather has been very very kind the last month. You know it's humid, uh, but 
humid but not too hot that's not stopping things from growing. They're growing well. So, and uh, I think the conversation is that uh, some of the growers and consultants have never seen retention so high in some yes. of the crops. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the fruit on the crops I saw, phenomenal. I might, um, I might, uh, Put a photo on there for Manish to have a look at uh, once the once the webinar is done. But uh, yeah, so we better just help. Uh, is there is there maybe there's a problem with Kavina getting her um, her camera going? I think she might have logged out and be logging back in. Um, I'm still here. I'm just trying to figure out why the video is not working. It does say it's on, but do you have a do you have a slider for the camera? Oh. Like a physical I slider. Start my video. Just a uh, do you have any kind of privacy shutter in your uh, laptop? Um, uh, maybe that is why. There may be a physical shutter in front of your webcam, uh, which is the, uh, blocking your camera. Yeah, now it is working. Now I can see you. Oh, you can see me. Cool. Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Um, maybe just Wonderful. Never mind. <laughs> oh, you were on the Golden Gate Bridge for a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so I'm here now. Yes. Wonderful. Hello, Dr. Kavina. How do you do? Hi, very good. Thank you. How are you? Absolutely fine. I hope you're fine too. Yeah. So how does it work? Do I just start the presentation? Yes, uh, you will be. Yeah, uh, well, uh, yeah, Kavina, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's, um, thank you for being here. And um, uh, Mr. Daga, Manish Daga is, is going to, he's our host on uh, on here. So he's going to um, introduce you. And I think, um, I'm not sure if, um, I'm not sure if uh, our hosts have let all the, um, all the participants in yet, but um, I think they have. So, yeah, I think it's probably best if we hand over to uh, Manish to uh, make the introductions. Yes. Uh, so nice of you. Samar has joined. Vivek? Uh, no, he has not joined. Not joined. No? Okay, fine. So I think it is the uh, right time to start. And uh, welcome all of you to this third webinar series of Australia-India Cotton Collaboration. Now, why this cotton collaboration is so important, so significant, so critical going ahead? Australia, the country which grows uh, cotton to the highest yield, it's, it's not easy to reach that position and retain that position, but Australia has been able to do it. Attain a higher yield in cotton, is it a long duration crop, a crop very sensitive to pests and weather, but consistently uh, increasing the yield, working on the yields and retaining the yields is what Australia has been able to done simultaneously. They have been also able to maintain an excellent quality of cotton, which has given them a very niche position in the textile industry that they always get a premium on their cotton. Plus, they are able to maintain that high yield, which compensates the cotton farmers well. That is Australia. On the other side, we have India. The Cotton uh, grown in India is in the highest amount of land. About 35% of the world cotton growing land comes from India. But only 25% of cotton comes from India. But the challenge remains that the productivity, the yield of Indian cotton is lowered. Although many, many, many smallholder farmers are continuously since years, since hundreds of years, thousands of years growing cotton. So the need remains plus the advantage remains that a lot of land is available to grow cotton. Plus, there are many varieties of cotton grown in India, from counts starting from fours and six counts to even 140s and 150s counts. So very coarse cotton to very super, super fine cotton, also absorbent cotton. Lot of options available for spinners and consumers of cotton in India and four defined seasons, of course, for growing cotton, which is a plus point. A lot of hybrid technology in India, which can be you know, a, a, a roadmap to explore a seed technology also. So here is Australia. On the other side is India. Both countries have collaborated into a foreign trade agreement, the recent economic cooperation and trade agreement, the ECTA that we call, 
between Australia and India has opened a highway of opportunities. We are delighted to announce this collaboration of All India Cotton Farmer Producer Organization, which is a family of over 200 farmer producer organizations comprising of nearly 100,000 farmers, along with Australia High Commission Agriculture and Dr. Richard Nail represents that he is very much present today. And Cotton Australia, represented by Adam Kay, who is the CEO and a very dynamic person himself. So the possibilities of bilateral trade between these two very important countries in cotton textiles is immense. And uh, we welcome all of you, the spectators, especially um, I will name some uh, Mr. Dhru Sood is here, representatives of CICR are here, and a lot many people are joining are, are, and are likely to join. So this is webinar series number three. Why is all this important? Because the yield of cotton depends on three things, seed, soil, and weather. Seed is, of course, uh, the root of all, all that is grown and that we have discussed before. We have also discussed soil, and now today we focus on weather. How climate resilient agriculture can become in cotton? What impact does weather have on cotton? We have a very specialist here with us, Dr. Kavina Dayal. Welcome, Ms. Dayal, to you. She is a climate uh, scientist in, just read out her portfolio. Yes, I have it now. Uh, she is a climate uh, scientist in the ABRES Agriculture Forecasting and Policy Branch at Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Dr. Dayal uses her knowledge and expertise in climate science to deliver policy relevant climate insights for agriculture. Dr. Dayal was a project lead for integration of climate information for crop yield forecasting at CSIRO and co-developed innovative decision support tools for Australian farmers. So, so much has been done for this uh, cotton product and other agriculture products to make it weather resilient, climate resilient. So not taking much of your time, I invite Dr. Kavina Dayal to share her views and expertise on how and what she has done uh, for cotton and uh, other prime agriculture crops. Yes, Mr. Dayal. All right, so can you see the presentation? Uh, yeah, but it's a back end view. You can just uh, screen share once again and you can show the actual screen. Just a second. Um, can you see the actual presentation or notes? No, no we are seeing the notes there. right now, but uh, oh. you can again reshare. Let me try again. Okay. Um, Uh, you can first put a PPT in the uh, full screen mode and then you can try the screen sharing. Yeah, okay. Just a second, sorry, I'm just um, figuring it out. Yes, it is uh, fine now. Thank you. But, but is it, can you see the actual presentation or is it yes. also showing the notes? Not the actual presentation. Yeah. Oh, looks, great. Looks, Perfect. Looks great. Okay. All right. Um, so I believe it's morning in India. So good morning um, and also good afternoon here in Australia. So it is a pleasure to share some of my work um, on um, what's been happening in the climate space in the cotton industry. So before I actually get into the real talk, I um, thought why not tell you a bit about myself and why I do what I do. Um, so I grew up in Fiji on a farm. My family had a sugarcane farm, um, which was for commercial purpose. And we also had some livestock, um, rice and horticulture for some uh, for home consumption. Um, so while growing up on the farm, I experienced a number of climatic events and um, those events affected our farm production. Um, and for example, the common ones were tropical cyclones and droughts. 
And um, so those experiences left me with uh, lots of questions about climate. So after high school, I ended up in Hawaii to study meteorology. And um, I wrote a master's thesis on tropical cyclones. I then moved to Australia and did my PhD on droughts. And um, Australia is no stranger to extreme climatic events and drought is one of them. So following which I um, started my postdoctoral fellowship at CSIRO, where I worked on a number of um, projects, integrating climate information for different agricultural sectors and cotton was one of them. Um, so that's a bit about me. Now, what I really want to cover in this talk is uh, some of the work that I have done a couple of years ago, or also share the insights from the work that's been done by some of um, the other scientists in this um, area of research. And Dr. Michael Bench here on this call, um, who I worked with on some of the cotton projects um, that he led when we were both working at CSIRO in our former roles. Um, I also want to mention early on that cotton seed distributors own the copyright of most of the work that I will be sharing in this talk. And Michael um, here is a, research, a commercial research manager at cotton seed distributors, who you've heard from in the last talk. Thank you, Mike, um, for being a part of this seminar. And um, also in this presentation, this presentation is rather short, so we can have more time for the discussion at the end. Now, um, let's start with where cotton is grown in Australia. So you may have seen these maps already, but it's always nice to get a um, reminder. So cotton is grown in the eastern parts of Australia where climatic conditions are suitable. Um, lately, there has been some extension to the cotton growing region um, in the tropical north, as you can see on the bottom right map here. Um, of course, uh, with the cotton varieties that can, you know, thrive in those um, climates. Now, Australia's climate is highly variable. Um, here I'm showing the 30 year climatology of the average minimum and maximum temperature and rainfall of annual, as well as for the October to April period, which captures the cotton growing season. So as you can see, spatially, there's large variability. But if you were to look at the temporal um, average temperature, Australia's climate has warmed um, by 1.47 degrees um, Celsius uh, since the national records began um, in early 1900s. Um, as you all know that cotton commodity is heavily reliant on the thermal conditions um, throughout the growing season. While rainfall is also important, it um, is high but not as critical as the temperature, for example, because in Australia, we both have the dry land and irrigated cotton and where the um, grown takes into account which cotton varieties goes into the soil. Um, just to give you an example of um, some of the research, research that Mike's team has done in the past. So here looking at the two locations, Narrabri and Griffith, so you, um, you can see on the map on the right, so the two locations. So Narrabri is in the northern part where temperature is warmer than Griffith, which is, you know, further south. So in the graph, uh, these graphs show that um, cumulative cotton growing season temperatures, you know, day degrees, have been increasing over time. Um, so what do we, at both locations, sorry. Yeah, so what do we learn from this? So what's even more obvious um, is that the number of degree um, days that we are seeing now in Griffith, which is the southern location, is similar to what we've seen in um, Narrabri in the past. So this signal is really indicating uh, the climate change that's been, um, that's been observed in these locations or in Australia in general as well. Um, another research by Mike's team where they tested um, seasonal climate forecast for some of um, the key decision making. So, so these are some of the decisions that, you know, you, you can um, think of when you're um, in the business. And as you can see here on this chart, there's a number of decision points um, throughout cotton growing season. And each decision takes into account um, seasonal climate outlook. So three months ahead of time. Um, so I'm going to show you an example with, uh, of the decision point, which is highlighted here in yellow, um, basically whether there'll be any issues with early crop vigor. So basically what this experiment does is it looks at um, climate um, 
forecast, but basically the hindcast. And um, they, uh, in, you know, for this experiment, they used the Poema seasonal climate model. So this is an older model, um, which was available at the time of the research. But um, this model has been decommissioned and replaced by a higher resolution uh, model called XSS, which has a 60 kilometer resolution, but Poama had a causal resolution of 250. So um, uh, again, they've used the hindcast uh, seasonal climate forecast. So basically the hindcast is uh, downscaled and cali calibrated to the five kilometer resolution. Um, and then from there, you can actually extract the, um, the information for point location. So if, you, if you're interested in a particular location, you can grab the um, nearest grid data, grid point data, climate data, and then you can do the experiments. So this model um, had 32 ensembles, ensemble members. So you can generate 32 different um, simulations for each point location. Um, so using the so same experiment, so using the degree day calculation, first square, for example, historically occurs earliest in the northern areas because um, it's warmer up north and then later in the southern locations. This is um, the result of um, one of the locations studied. And uh, as you can see, the median poema predictions were generally close to the actual data, especially in the average years. However, in the cooler and warmer years, um, the model did not cr um, correctly match the extent of these extremes, you know, both highs and lows. So, um, yeah, so you, you see the blue tra trend lines, they're not necessarily matching the actual um, X and Y line. Now, I do want to make a point here is that Poema model had been, um, had a causal resolution. So the hindcast forecast also had a um, slightly lower accuracy compared to the newer model that we have now. Um, um, hence why, you know, the, the results are sort of um, not as great here, but the actual um, uh, idea, the, the general idea is to show you some of the ways seasonal climate forecast had been used in the Corden research and that can provide some useful information um, for some of the decisions. So conclusions from that particular study. Um, possible improvement in the first um, flower date prediction that could be used for management by using seasonal climate forecast. However, um, you know, the limited duration and accuracy of that um, climate model forecast meant end of season could not be predicted in the experiment. But with the new climate model, XSS, um, uh, which has a higher resolution and is now available, can be used for further testing. So unfortunately, I don't have any results from this particular model, but you get the idea. So um, um, that was an example of the work where seasonal climate forecast had been used in cotton research. Um, as you can see, um, seasonal climate forecast um, had also been incorporated in um, some of the innovative tools, which I'm about to show, um, give you some snippets. Um, again, um, I also want to mention that whatever I'm going to show next is um, um, copyright. Um, is owned by the cotton seed distributors. So um, for con confidentiality reasons, I cannot share the outputs of um, any particular uh, location, but we'll give you the general idea as to what the tool, uh, individual tool does. So basically the, uh, the idea is to in incorporate the climate forecast or seasonal climate information and see um, what information you can get for, um, for the cotton. Now, this one is one of the um, tools called Day Degree Calculator. So basically, um, this tool generates climate uh, information for the location of interest, as you can see in the screenshot here. It gives um, the first look of what the climate of that location across different um, years, um, um, as well as um, gives the decadal average of those um, indices. So basically, this tool, what it does is, you know, you can enter your start and end date, and then you get uh, all these different climate metrics, as you can see here on this on this screenshot. And then you can also compare. So if you're in, in the season now, you can compare what the previous seasons has been like for that particular location, and also you can compare with the 10-year um, average. 
So it's a very um, um, good tool. And then, um, so the other one is called simulated time to est uh, estimated first flowers. Again, um, this is also owned by CSD. So um, this tool allows flexibility in the date of interest again. So you can enter your date of interest and then a certain um, index um, you can you know, get out of it. So these numbers obviously vary from field to field and um, it gives you the information on um, the index based on different entries you've made. So you can change your date and get the estimate of when the first flower date occurs. Right, so um, now uh, this tool called Barry, it, I'm happy to share, um, uh, I'm very actually, actually very happy to say that I was one of the key players in the development of um, this tool in my former role at CSRO and this was a um, joint research project with Corten C distributors. So this tool runs on a machine learning model that spits out Gordon yield estimates. So um, what I had done at the time for this model was I, um, I so recording, you know, in, in, in the fields, um, they record many different variables. So there's heaps of data. So what you do is um, you, if you want to predict the yield, not all of those variables are, um, I guess, going to indicate what the yield is going to be um, compared to, you know, the fewer ones. So the first first step was to see which which um, variables were, you know, um, uh, giving a higher weight towards the uh, yield prediction. And then using those variables, as you can see here, you know, um, the ball count, effective rainfall, cutout date, and all of these different variables were crucial for um, estimating the um, yield. And then um, basically what it does is, um, it, it, this is an interactive tool, so you can slide the bar. And then every time you do that, the uh, machine learning model in the background um, gives you um, the estimate. So um, it's good in a way that because um, what it does is it uh, goes back and trains uh, on the data that's you know sitting in the background, and then it spits out um, the actual, oh sorry, the uh, yield estimate, and also give you sort of the confidence level um, with this plus and minus one bells per hectare, for example. So yes, yeah, so an interactive tool, so you can change those numbers and see um, different results. And then um, there's this one called Cotton Tracker that keeps track of how the season is unfolding for different indices for a particular location. Um, these are some of the state-of-the-art tools out there, but they have um, been optimized as more data becomes available to provide information with the highest accuracy possible. Um, you know, hence to help the cotton growers with informed decision making. Now, those are the things um, uh, that used climate, seasonal climate forecast and, you know, the tools we've seen. Um, I want to show you one other thing, which is also an interactive tool that I was, again, involved in in the early stages of its development. It's called My Climate View, which is part of a bigger project called um, Climate Services for Agriculture. Um, so this is just a screenshot. So basically, maybe I can, what I can do is I can um, run you through. So what I can do is stop sharing this. And Yeah, this particular screen so that I can show you. Um, can you can you see, see the screen? Can somebody confirm they can see this? My climate view. Yes, yes. Yep. yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. So basically, um, it's kind of small on this particular screen. I think it's um, um, I don't know, meant for a mobile phone or something. So basically, at the bottom you see who all funded and CSR is where we did all this project at the time, and I was working there. So in this. Um, um, tool, you enter your location. So I'm just going to try Mori, which is um, one of the regions where cotton is grown. 
and then I can okay so basically yeah, this was a bigger project and it involves um, all different commodities that that can be found in at this particular location so I'm going to select cotton and then um, view information now this is some of the things you can um, see for cotton so growing season rainfall now it shows you the historical um, um, number so um, between you know the growing season how much how much rainfall on average has been accumulated and then um, also the, another thing um, which is you know not uh, we've seen in other tools um, is the future information so climate projection and um, yeah so 2050 is average so what's going to be like in terms of growing season rainfall in the future and then you can also, um, so another index was um, wet days and harvest. So, you know, in historically it was five days, but maybe in the future it's going to be seven days and so on, and heat stress. But um, as you scroll down, so you can also get some general climate um, factors. So other things you can get um, for this particular location, hot days, um, cold days, you know, evaporation and so on. So all these climate variables showing you the historical numbers as well as the future projection. All right, so with that, I think I would like to, I guess, finish there and uh, open the floor for any question or discussion. Am I still sharing the screen? No. Yes, Richard. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, you're comfortable taking questions? Yeah. Oh, Michael, yeah. Michael, are you there? <laughs> yes, sir. I would like to also welcome Dr. Michael Banch, the ICAC researcher of the year 2023. And he is also hails from Australia. He was our uh, respected speaker for webinar number two on seed management. And uh, yes. welcome, Mr. Banch. You're mute, Mike. Yep. Good morning. I'm here just to support Kavina. So uh, 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 direct your questions at Kavina first, and if Kavina can't can't answer them, I, I will attempt to help. Great. Okay, Rich, you've got your hands up. Thanks, Dr. Kavina. That was a really wonderful um, presentation. I think I'd just like to make a general uh, comment rather than a question, but over the past 30 to 40 years, um, with increasing research and development and innovation across our agriculture sector, um, there's been a a much stronger focus on data-based farming in, in across agriculture, fisheries, and forestry, uh, and certainly for cotton, this is this is no different. Um, I guess, uh, Dr. Kavina, just for the benefit of the participants here, um, would it be possible for you to please uh, copy and paste some of the links um, to to um, each of the each of those um, the the websites that you talked about, which have that data focused approach? I think that might be useful to the Indian side to see how we leverage data to make more informed on farm decision making processes. Sure, happy to do that. Kavina, what a, maybe the best way to do it is I could share a couple of uh, uh, publications that talk about the history of. Uh, the one thing I can say, Australian cotton has actually um, been the leader in use of digital tools and data. Um, 40 years ago, believe it or not, um, Australian cotton had a, a centralised database using um, modems and phones to record all their pest management data. That was 40 years ago. So we were leading the way from a very early stage. I can share with you, Kavina, some publications that tell about that history and where things are going in general. Well, that was Thanks, Mike. Uh, Kavina, Adam Kay here. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was wonderful. I just wonder, can we can we um, move out a bit and um, and think about um, the climate influences? Like we're always hearing about the Indian Ocean Dipole and the Southern Oscillation Index and and alike. And I just wondered, you know, does the Indian Ocean Dipole have any impact on our Indian colleagues that um, that are on this? Um, that are on this webinar, you know, and, and from a forecasting point of view, 
I, I'm, I'm very familiar with what an impact it has on Australia, but um, I wondered about our colleagues um, in India and, and how, you know, sea surface temperatures and, and things in the Indian Ocean have an impact. Yeah, wonderful. Um, thank you, Adam. So, yes, yeah, so Indian Ocean Dipole is uh, one of the climate drivers um, that affects Australia, like I said. And so in Australia, it's normally um, um, southeast. So basically, you know, if, if you draw a diagonal line, so that's pretty much where um, it affects. So um, basically, when it's positive Indian Ocean Dipole, so um, that's when the convection is sitting um, to um, the far west, and then um, and then dry as um, I'm sorry, the colder sea surface temperature towards Australia. So, particularly what that does is it suppresses the rainfall in Australia. So I'm guessing, uh, given the location of India where it falls um, for Indian Ocean Dipole, um, yeah. So it I don't, I don't to be honest, like I haven't really looked at um, in detail where it affects rainfall and how much, but I'm guessing at some location it's suppressing and some location it's um, enhancing the rainfall. Um, but I think monsoonal rain has a um, lot of effect on Indian um, climate, um, especially depends on when is the growing cotton growing season though. So that's another thing. So for example, in Australia, it's um, happening now. So cotton is growing um, at the moment. So yeah. But yeah, I mean, Indian Ocean up and Dipole is pr pretty much like one of the major climate drivers. Yeah. No, thank, thank you for that. I see Mike's got his hand up. He might have something to add. Well, g'day, g'day everyone. I, as far as we know, yes, the Indian Ocean Dipole um, has, has, an, has an influence on India. What's usually happening in India uh, in that part of the world usually does influence at least the west coast of Australia. Um, yeah. Probably a little bit of the clue to what you know what what Kavina has presented today is that the the climate tools and the tools that we've actually shown you today are are the actual frameworks where we assess climate drivers. So we we utilize we utilize our models like Axis S, and I'm sure India has got access to similar type numerical models. And we've used these particular cotton tools to actually uh, assess climate drivers. So we're turning we're turning the climate information into something that's cotton relevant so we can have that conversation with growers and what Kavina has shown today is uh, as many of those instances where we'll uh, we, we do exactly that yeah thanks Mike and also um, just want to add um, in my role at the moment um, uh, at uh, ABARES um, because it's informing the policy. So what I do at the moment, um, the publication will come out next month, so I cannot share the um, findings just yet. But what we're trying to do is uh, we are um, sort of um, coming up with the five-year projections. So what um, the El sorry, ENSO and Indian Ocean Dipole is going to do. So basically, what you know, the probabilities of getting them in the next five years. And then that then um, decides decide what the production cotton production is going to be in Australia, and also how that affects the um, the commodity price in Australia as well as globally. So um, I cl work closely with economists, um, you know, for for this particular role, and um, my role is to provide them the climate information, and they then take that information and incorporate in their forecast which is, you know, the production um, as well as the price forecast for the next five years. Dr. Kavina, one of the questions that comes to the mind is since you joined and since you are into this weather forecasting or, you know, uh, increasing the productivity of cotton, what has been the impact in terms of figures? I mean, the last five years, uh, how, how much percent uh, of the productivity has grown with uh, the use of this? tool and technology? Very good question, Manish. Um, I think either Adam, Adam or Mike will be in a good position to give you the actual numbers in terms of um, the, the actual production are coming out of the farm. But what I can tell you is the use of climate information, um, the uptake of climate information in the decision making, we've seen um, it, that increase. So the more the more work we do in terms of in the climate space, um, you know, the more uptake we see. But it also takes into account the translation of it. So, I, for example, I, ha I have a training in climate science, but then I'm also able to translate that um, forecast into what the end user needs. 
So end users need different information, um, different, basically the information being packaged in different ways that they can take up and, you know, apply in their decision making. But in terms of, yeah, production, um, yeah, to be honest, like, I don't know where the trend is, but I'm guessing it's going up for sure, Adam. <laughs> Know, yeah. Yes, the yields are certainly going up. I think, yeah, there's no doubt if I reflect on the climate tools we've got, the forecasting in Australia is incredibly accurate four days out, you know, incredibly accurate four days out. You go to seven days out, it's a little bit less accurate. Um, but there's also the, the forecast, the sort of the seasonal forecast, you know, El Nino, which is very dry for us, or La Nina, which is a wet sort of cycle. That's very important to our farmers. It helps them with their their overall decision making, and um, and so I think these are very very important tools that um, that that our farmers are using. But there's there's no doubt they place great credence on that four day forecast. That's you know they really would base decisions on that because that's become just so accurate. And mm -hmm. and I'm sure we're going to see the seven day forecast become more accurate as time goes on and. And um, yeah, but, but um, yeah, these are really important tools because every farmer knows how important that forecasting the the climate is and how you can make you know informed decisions for your operations. So, yeah, no, it's really important. Thanks, uh, Adam. How, Dr. Karina, how do you reach out, or Adam, or uh, uh, any one of you, Dr. Banch, can answer? How do you reach out to the farmers? Basically, how are the farmers? Uh, informed of this, uh, any development or or any preventive corrective action to be taken. Well, I, I think the the tools that um, that Kavina just spoke about, you know, the um, cotton seed distributors have them on their their website for their their members for the Australian farmers. But I think there's the concept. You know, th these are very specific for the Australian region. But I think. What we're sharing is the concept of some of these tools of utilising the weather data to to make informed decisions, and that might give some guidance to you know researchers in India on on how they could develop similar sorts of systems. So, whilst you know I don't want to to um, say to you, my Indian colleagues, the farmers there, look, you can just take this tool and use it there. I think the concept is important, and um, and I think that's the that's the thing you know that the these models and you know and I'm sure. You know, Dr. Banj and, and Kavina would be happy to talk to the scientists and 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 give them some insights into that. You know, it's it's um you're down into the science that I'm not 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 good on, but I'm but I've got enormous faith in the tools that this team has put together. You know, our scientists have you know particularly at the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology have got very high credit with our farmers and and you know they really respect the work they do and so. Uh, yeah, I, th I think we could give some guidance there, and uh, but um, yes, the, these tools are very uh, regional specific, but the concepts could be used in any region, I, I would think, and and that's where you know that's the part where collaboration between scientists could be good. You know, if um, you know Kavina was able to share some of the concepts, you know, scientists in India could use those concepts and and take it further. And I'm sure she's got scientific papers and things that are coming out that she'll be able to share with her colleagues. Yes, uh, Adam, and many scientists are rightly, uh, are, are currently in this webinar from uh, CICR, we have from North India, Sirsa, I can see from Nagpur, there are scientists from even South India, there are scientists, there's one Dr. Bhadvishnu Jade, who is a crop, uh, uh, cotton crop specialist from Jain Irrigation, he is here, uh, ex Nabad. That is a uh, bank which takes care of agri-finance. XCGM is there right now. The many relevant people are here, and I hope all of you take this up as an urgent issue that weather change is part of our life from here on. Climate change is part of our life, and a general data say, says that that's over 30% crop loss in cotton because of climate change. And that is huge. I mean, if you can save that also, that would be converted into an increase in productivity and production. So any outcome of this webinar is going to be what we learn, what Australia has been doing uh, over the years you know, to protect their cotton crop and increase their yield. So 
one more thing uh, that comes to the mind is Indian context, uh, Dr. Dayal. I mean, any input on a dry land farming would be very helpful because over 60% of land in India is rain-fed agriculture for cotton. Uh, that's a very good question, Manish. Um, I wonder if Michael is still online because he had some problem um, with his Zoom. Um, so dry land is mainly in the northern areas. So basically, um, the sowing, I'm guessing the sowing um, dates differ compared to the um, irrigated cotton. And um, that takes into account, you know, what the average climate um, condition is uh, in those areas and also the different varieties go into the soil as well so the varieties that can actually thrive in those um climate in and also the soil type as well so yeah so that's um that what that's what i can add maybe adam if michael is not online then if you can well I, well I think as well as climate forecasting there are a number of tools that farmers can use with rain grown production and importantly one of those is the row configuration, you know, the skip row configuration where you're, you're having greater distances between the plants and so they can better utilize the, the moisture in the soil. So, you know, in a rain grown, you know, dry land farming system, the moisture is everything. Now we're, we're lucky that the soils where we grow rain grown cotton in Australia are heavy clay soils, they're vertisol soils, um, and they've got a high moisture holding capacity that will take the crop, you know, about halfway through its cycle. So you only really need, you know, uh, 50 millimetres of rain at some stage halfway through the cycle to replenish that soil to get a good crop. So, you know, just like any rain grown system, there's, um, you know, a, an element of luck with the uh, with the climate. But, um, uh, but um, yeah, there are tools you can use to ensure that crop can um, can hang on as long as it can. And certainly those row configurations are, um, are, are a tool that the farmers use. Thanks, Adam. Uh, one more question uh, comes to the mind that can this weather forecasting, of course, one is for the yield protection, yield enhancement, can it lead, yield to uh, crop forecasting? You mean the yield forecasting? Yes, if you see El Nino or a La Nina year ahead, I mean, can we forecast yeah. the right crop to be grown? I mean, it may not be cotton, which, which may be suitable any other crop that would do in that agroclimatic zone. Yeah, so that's one of the research um, that's been done at CSR at the moment. So, you know, the tool I was showing, so that tool shows what all um, commodities can be found in that particular location. So what scientists are doing is, you know, they are um, um, testing the viability of different crops under different um, climate, for example. So if it's, you know, we know that climate um, is warming in Australia, so at least we know that for sure. So then what crop is going to be, um, yeah, so be thriving in that particular location and then maybe cotton for example down the line several years down the line it can thrive in some other locations where it's more suitable so those are the uh, different tests so you know the map i was showing earlier the um the new um, areas being tested so that's part of the reason you know part of the thing that that's been done to see where um crops can thrive yeah and and, and we've, we've seen that. we've we've seen cotton um growing uh, over the last 30 years moved some seven or 800 kilometres south of where it's ever been grown before from 30 years ago. Now, some of that is management and some of that is potentially climate. I'm not sure of the percentage for each of those, but um, but um, yeah, there's certainly uh, we're seeing cotton grown in southern locations in Australia, which, you know, in India would be the equivalent of moving north. Um, we're seeing it you know, we're seeing it move to areas that we thought were too cool for cotton and um, and it's proving not to be the case. Now, how much of that is the varieties and the management and how much is a change in climate? Um, I'll leave that to the scientists to uh, to hypothesise on, but, um, but it's just an observation. Yeah. yeah Dr. Kavina, have you uh, uh, in your, you know, uh, 
tenure uh, suggested that more cotton should be grown in a certain area and less cotton should be grown in a certain area in Australia. It's a big country yeah. and uh, you would have seen different weather yeah. patterns. Certainly is. I think cotton is um, it's a it's probably one of the resilient crops I know. So um, yeah, so um, I'm guessing the expansion is certainly possible and it's happening and being tested. So I guess yeah, moving south because it's getting warmer, so the climate is also um, I guess becoming suitable for some of the varieties. So yes, yeah, so those are my thoughts. But I'm happy for Michael or Adam to add. I, I think. One of the interesting pieces of this work that um, that Michael's been involved with, and um, and um, and um, uh, you know the CSIRO have done a lot of, is just the impact of um, of um, climate change on cotton, and 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 looking at what might happen because we know that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is increasing. Now, what does that do? Well, for plants, that's wonderful. That, that stimulates plant growth. We know that mm -hmm. the temperature is increasing and for some plants, that's good. You know, I guess there are gonna be certain temperatures where it's it gets too hot. And we know that in some areas, water be, could become more limiting. So we're gonna to have to be very careful with our, with our water management. But even just understanding what those plants do with higher carbon dioxide and higher temperatures, it can help us understand how we might use our growth regulators because those plants tend to tend to maybe run away and get too vegetative and, and grow too tall. And we can use different techniques to um, control the, the, the vegetative growth and, and get it to set fruit. So I think we're, you know, there's some wonderful sort of forward looking work that the CSIRO team has been doing in this, uh, in this area. And I think it gives us some, some ideas on how to, how to manage the plant in the areas that we're currently growing it as the climate, you know, as the climate changes. But Mike, I think Michael, I hope you're unmuted now and you might yes, you know, uh, build on that. Uh, You've been involved in that. Waiting to share something. Yes, Dr. Michael, please. Yeah. Well, apologies everyone. The zoom crashed on me. I had to come go out and come back in, but uh, Kavina and Adam have been doing a great job answering the questions. I think a few really interesting things from, perspective of an Australian cotton industry is that uh, cotton actually is probably one of mo our most uh, uh, adaptive crops to uh, water stress and climate change for some of the things that Adam talked about, you know, CO2 responsive. In fact, it's one of, because it actually has the ability to uh, stop growing when conditions are not so good and actually kick off again, actually makes it one of our most uh, uh, versatile rain fed crops. Um, and in fact, it's probably been grown more for that scenario because it actually uh, it it's highly resilient to the variability in climate. The Manish, coming back to your your question around you know the work that we've done and how we portray a lot of our information um, around uh, managing cotton in Australia is really about uh, managing the risk and actually understanding where the risks actually. Well, how much risk is actually are uh, you contending with, with uh, whether it be economic, climate, or otherwise? So, big always been a big emphasis using technologies like we've shown you today to actually portray a lot of the information in the context of risks. You know, like uh, to give you an example, you know, we're talking about an eighty percent chance of being successful if you grow cotton in a in a certain way, um, and we've linked linked a lot of these technologies with the climate forecast to be able to make those assessments and, and advise growers whether they grow a certain configuration or or at times grow another crop. So massive, massive, uh, uh, you know, the key to managing cotton in Australia, uh, managing crops in the Australian environment is actually uh, managing the risk and understanding what level of risk you uh, is always going to be there. We talk, we talk about the concept of irreducible risk, um, there's always going to be risk, but how we actually minimise its impact, and and that that's what that shapes our narrative and the way we undertake our research in Australia. Um, so yeah, we I I work with many rain fed crops, and some of the ones that Adam used to you know work with, where we walked into the room and we would do we would sit in the room with growers for hours and walk out, and they would they would be confident with the growing conditions that they would have, is that they'd be sure that they could if they managed the crop this this way with the soil types 
and the rainfall that we get and the configuration, they had a, an 80% chance of achieving the yield, which um, which meant that they could actually uh, um, you know, bank on provi um, providing certain inputs and, and so forth. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michael. While you're here, there's also one uh, representative from Jain Irrigation here, which is one of the leading irrigation companies in India. Uh, soil moisture is so important, like climate change. If there is change in temperature, you need to retain the soil moisture for agriculture. Is uh, I heard Australia is doing something special in irrigation to retain the soil moisture. Anything different that you are doing? Uh, well, uh, it probably... It, we're probably referring more to our rain-fed crops than our irrigated crops. We're very lucky we, uh, with irrigation, we're able to top up that soil moisture and we look to utilise every bit of that. Um, but in terms of rain-fed production, uh, we do two things that uh, are very uh, important. We actually uh, fallow some of our country, which we actually take it out of production to fill the, the bucket of water back up. And water is so valuable in our environment that that's, it's, it's worth taking some of our land out of production for a time to, to ensure that. Uh, well, in fact, sometimes that's the only way we actually can get production because if we don't have any water in the profile, we, can grow, we don't grow anything. And secondly, um, and Oliver probably, Oliver Knox, probably Dr. Oliver Knox in his presentation probably mentioned this strongly, the use of uh, crop residues and cover crops to uh, assist with infiltration of moisture um, and improving soil health to retain moisture. Um, and so, yes, uh, the use of stubble and residues is, is extremely important in our rain fed systems, um, so much so that it has uh, large influences on the way we manage pests and weeds to, uh, to, to ensure that we maximise that stubble at the end of the crop. The soil moisture as well as the nutrients uh, would increase. Yep, yep. Um, so uh, infiltration of the water, um, but also in, in incorporating and uh, retaining those those uh, residues actually improves soil structure, which we which ultimately builds a bigger bucket that we can store. Yes, residue management is also um, a very integral part. Anything in recycling of water, Dr. Michael? Uh, well, we. Uh, for, yeah, for, so, for farm purposes? Um, yep, so in our irrigation systems, they're of what we would call uh, very much a closed irrigation system. So we capture any of our runoff from irrigation if, when that occurs. And sometimes within reason, we catch rain, uh, runoff from our rainfall events. So they we, we circul recirculate the water so we don't lose the water within our systems. Um, and... Um, and we have a number of systems that, you know, uh, uh, manage the, try to reduce the labour requirements for our irrigation, which means that we can focus on other aspects of irrigation. So we have, um, we predominantly, because our irrigation is predominantly furrow flood irrigation. Um, and, we, and, and obviously there are systems where the soils are not so great with these drip and overhead systems. Right. Uh... Dr. Kavina Deyal, one most critical question, I mean, the critical question of the day, I can say, uh, for you, there are uh, many um, other people who have joined. One is uh, Mr. Viresh Kadali, who represents an Indian corporate, West Fund, India Limited. They are a uh, fully integrated company, also into sustainable agriculture. Then there is Hetal Shah, who, who has many, um, over 50 uh, sustainable agriculture pro projects, then uh, there's one Mr. Hiren, who's a young entrepreneur who has a spinning mill, who's a consumer. Light food security is an issue, you know, it's a global issue. Raw material security for the textile industry is also an issue right now. We do not have that much raw material in India in terms of cotton as uh, keeping pace with the consumption that is going up of cotton. So to face this and, uh, you know, combined with dry land irrigation, I would just give an example of what happened this year, the last season of cotton. The main sowing season starts in June in India. In the north of India and, and western India, where they have irrigation, it starts in May. But in most rain-fed areas, it starts in June. Throughout June, there was no rainfall. In July, there was very heavy rainfall. August, we saw one of the driest August of last 100 years in India. 
September there was rain. After 23rd September, there was no rain in most of the rain-fed areas. Again in November end, there was heavy rain which damaged the standing crops, especially the crop grown on irrigated land because they had uh, uh, gained certain height and they couldn't withstand the torrential rain you know, combined with wind. So this situation has really compromised the cotton yield in India. Simultaneously, you know, they had shaken the cotton farmers also that do they need to continue growing more cotton or should they be shifting? to some other crops. I mean, anything that, uh, you know, uh, you and your team can suggest would be a good tool to start with. I mean, because climate change is going to happen year on year. So next year, we did not know how things would turn out, but definitely it would be un, uh, predictable as far as the general terms goes, but with your expertise, how this can be at least tapped, monitored and uh, capitalized. So um, one thing I can say about what you've just mentioned, you know, rain and then no rain. And when it did rain, it was, you know, heavy rain. So we had something similar in Australia, I mean, last year as well. So basically what um, the main reason for that was the global ocean is pretty much warm everywhere. So ocean is a source of heat, right? So that's from the source of convection. So um, that's why, like, in Australia, we've, we've, we've had some really high rainfall and seasonal events. So I'm guessing India um, probably had something similar. But now you mentioned that, you know, the cotton in India is starting in June. So at the time, um, the Indian Ocean Dipole is not active. So that's kind of like in the neutral phase. So, um, so Indian Ocean Dipole doesn't play a major role at the time. So when it does become active is, you know, in spring. So in our spring, so your autumn. Um, so that's when um, the Indian Ocean Dipole is pretty much um, active and then either phase of it, you know, will affect how the rainfall um, pattern changes. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of climate, I can say that, but in terms of um, choosing different crops, yes, um, I know um, here in Australia, um, we had some really cold days in October. It's a cold, cold shock. So when the temperature, nighttime temperature falls below 12 degrees Celsius. So um, that sort of damaged some of the cotton um, crops. Basically, you know, there was a germination phase and then cotton didn't um, get up the ground. So uh, when that happened, I think some of the farmers, this is, um, this is what, what I've heard, so don't quote me on this. So basically, they have um, switched to two different crops, for example. I think it was uh, um, maize or corn. Um, yeah, so they can swap. And, you know, so for, from a farmer perspective, they want to make, you know, some kind of um, money, like, you know, they want to make profit. So what they can do is they can choose a crop that can actually survive at the time. So, yeah, so... Yeah, I guess like those, those things happen for sure, um, you know, crop rotation. Um, they can choose different crop if one, uh, if the climate for one is not suitable, they can go with another at the time. Yeah. Yes, sir, Dr. Kavina. So nice of you to address that upfront. So as a weather expert, do you need, uh, do you think there is a need to redesign or realign the sowing season as per the weather prediction? In India, this, we, uh, you know, predominantly rain-fed uh, dry land agriculture. You mean when the season start? Um, yeah, I guess like um, the the variability geographically is there. So when when seeds go into the ground, it differs from the um, one location to the other. So I guess like looking at the climatology perspective, like what the average condition has been. So for example, I think for the seeds to go into the soil, they need um, the soil temperature to be. Um, 14 degrees Celsius and above for three consecutive days. So if, you know, those are the things we monitor. And um, we have, in fact, I was involved in one of the tools um, which is involving machine learning model was to to do that prediction. So basically looking at um, the historical um, data and then also the climate forecast for the next, oh, sorry, yeah, the um, weather forecast for the next seven days. And then taking that um, daily minimum and maximum temperature, you can actually predict the soil temperature. So those are the things, you know, you can you can see what the soil temperature is like and whether it's the right time to sow or not. So those are the things, yeah, I guess um, we are looking at. So basically what I'm trying to like say here is um, 
most of our research uh, or the farming in Australia is data driven now. So we're looking at, you know, all the data we have collected over the years and also the climate information. We So basically where cotton is grown, we have dense network of weather stations. So we can get weather stations. So if one um, location, so, you know, if you're interested in one location, you can actually compare the um, weather from one, you know, the nearby stations, which can be three or four around it. So. Um, looking at all that and all those data go into the models and then, you know, you can do different forecasts depends on what you, your target is. Yeah, so data driven. So any other questions from uh, the attendees are welcome. We will be now closing in the next uh, four to five minutes. Uh, we have taken very valuable time from our uh, speakers also and, and, and also our hosts and other invitees. So, any questions are most welcome uh, before we have the final remarks. I have uh, tried to answer uh, maximum those who came our way. Uh, only one thing, uh, um, Dr. Kavina, Dr. Michael, Adam and Richard, I mean, do can we have a small uh, you know, pilot where we can take 100 acres or 500 acres of land and can we have some uh climate predictive uh, or predicted agriculture model set up here is it possible to start on a smaller scale or how would it be best you know to get acquainted uh, with how technology is helping farmers at least protect their yield yes i think i think manish it would be one for the uh, climate scientists you know in india we could share the you know the the concept but the climate scientists would need to use the local data. That's the um, that's the key. It's that local data, I think, that that goes into the that drives all these models. And um, and whilst these beautiful models that we've talked about today are, uh, uh, have been built for you know the Australian cotton areas, they're not they're not going to work taking them to India. What we've got to do is utilise the same sort of concept, but the data from India. So um, you know, I think we can have more of these talks you know this this collaboration of australia and india will be ongoing and and i'm i'm very happy to report that um myself and our chairman who's a cotton farmer nigel burnett will be coming to barrett techs courtesy of um dr nile richard nile has has organized for us to come over and we'll also have a um a specialist on um on ginning and textile manufacturer um uh, renee vandersloos with us too so you know, there's going to be a chance to interact with some of your leadership um, at Baratex, and then as we visit some some of the farming areas with um, uh, Mr. Daga and um, and and Dr. Nile. So I, I'm looking forward to our visit at the end of this month. I think that's going to be a, a chance for us to uh, have further conversations about some of this important work. Yes, it is important, and it is uh, the need of the hour, Adam, for all of us. Especially in India, the small growing uh, cotton farmers and and the tribal cotton farmers, many women farmers also engage here. So it is directly linked to their future. Also, yes, Richard, uh, Dr. Richard, anything from you? Most welcome. Please share of you. Thank you, Manish. Look, in response to your question as well, I think these are discussions we can uh, commence further um, in the margins of Barat Tex and also at the cotton site uh, site farm visits. I think one comment I'd like to make to the group here is um, Australia is more and more focused than ever before, particularly with climate change, on precision agriculture. Um, we are really, really into big data. Um, so the tools that Adam Kay and Dr. Kavina Dyer and Dr. Mike Bange, there has been extensive investment in these digital uh, database tools across the entire sector. We're not talking just cotton, we're talking about dairy, we're, cotton, we're talking about wool, we're talking about wine, we're talking about grains. What we have in Australia is a system where we have a very strong co-investment initiative into research and development and also innovation through our rural research and development corporations. Um, to be able to fully uh, maximise the benefits of precision agriculture, we are looking at minimising inputs and maximising outputs as part of an agriculture system. And to be able to do that, you need to be able to leverage data within India. If you can leverage data within India, that will enable you across your entire agriculture sector to be able to minimise your inputs and maximise your outputs. Um, so 
we can definitely help with, with discussing these tools. But what's really needed is co-investment in these types of initiatives on the Indian side and also to look at sucking out all of that data, uh, update it year on year, and then using that to inform your tools moving on to make really informed on-farm decisions. Um, that's sort of the takeaway that I think I have from this key webinar and these three webinars that we've had is it's very important to have those tools, but also um, India uh, uh, collectively, we need to be looking at leveraging that data and collecting that data and, and analysing it to be able to make good decisions. Um, hopefully that's helpful, Mr. Dagger. It is helpful and I assure you that if we have a pilot of say X number of farmers, I mean, or X uh, amount of land, we can get you the relevant data for that so that you have a baseline of uh, where we get started and then we can have a front line going uh, down one season that uh, what uh, has been the target outcome and what has been the impact. Yes, Mr. Dr. Bainge. Thanks, Richard. I, look, Richard, just, just an offer and um, uh, Manish and everyone, I, unfortunately, I can't make the trip with Adam. Um, Adam kindly invited me to uh, to travel, but a little bit, a uh, very busy cotton season for us at the moment, unfortunately. But th th this context of uh, going to a new area, sharing uh, knowledge around things that we do in the cotton industry is not sort of foreign with us, uh, foreign to us. We, uh, you know, I'd highly advise, as Richard sort of pointed out, the, the idea of coming together, you know, if, if we choose to, to come up with uh, what we would call best bet or the best sort of you know options that you might want to consider for your 100 hectares or all the growers um, and we've certainly have been through that process where we, we we essentially go through and we look at the the knowledge that we have around cotton dissect it uh, ask questions whether it's relevant to your system and then come up with a set uh, you know, a management system that you may like to try or 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 go or give some recommendations about where you would go and analyze certain data to help you you know make those decisions so this concept of you know trying different things is certainly not foreign, and we um, absolutely would be uh, would be well you know we'd enjoy helping you um, from that perspective. You know these are principles that we can we can help you with. So um, when the time's appropriate, as Richard says, uh, and with the right resourcing, we can certainly uh, jump on board and help you with those sort of things uh, because we've done it before. Uh, we've gone to new regions in Australia with our own growers and and done these sort of activities. I think there cannot be a more appropriate time, Dr. Michael, the two country governments coming together for a foreign trade agreement and a long-term bilateral trade uh, alignment and uh, all of us coming together for the ICAC in India uh, not very long back and now the Bharat tax happening and you know most of the people, relevant people would be meeting and then farm visits and with you, um, Dr. Michael and, and Dr. Kavina, of course, uh, backed by Adam and Dr. Richard. I think, uh, yes, uh, maybe, I mean, if all of us decide that uh, get started on a pilot, uh, let us at least try out what can happen or what is possible here in trial and agriculture in India, what Australia has been doing fantabulously well throughout the years. Can it be replicated in, in India to a small extent to start with and then, you know, let the policymakers take over from there and see how we can uh, no, enlarge or uh, scale that. Dr. Dayal, how do you feel about this? I think it's a great initiative <laughs> and all this collaboration is amazing. Yes. So, yeah, yes. I was just reading something in the chat. So it looks like um, whether CIS in India is doing some of the work that we've mentioned. Yes, there. Uh, yes, Dr. B.K. Singh, would you like to share something? Uh, let me give him the access to unmute. He cannot unmute right now. Just a minute. Yeah, uh, Mr. Singh, you can uh, speak now. I have given you an access to unmute. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. We can. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes. Good afternoon. Sorry, I missed out some initial portion of the discussion I joined later on. We at the Weather Sys uh, are uh, doing uh, this kind of work uh, in India. We are uh, making granulated weather forecast uh, up to the village level, uh, seven days forecast. As you said, the four, 
four day forecast is uh, uh, much more accurate than the seven days. So uh, we are doing this. And we are also advising farmers according to the location and also according to the variety which they have shown through an app, which is uh, called Fasalzala. I'm founder of a company called SkyMet, which is uh, well known in India. But my personal involvement in agriculture is because uh, my background in agriculture and experience in uh, agriculture business in India. So we are uh, doing this for uh, almost all the major crops, including cotton, but uh, cotton has not been our focus so far, but we want to improve on it uh, with the experience and uh, knowledge of uh, the scientists from Australia will be too happy to collaborate. Uh, we 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 keep a good uh, eye on the uh, climate change and uh, temperature changes in sea surface temperatures, etc., which uh, you people are studying. And uh, uh, we we keep on watching various models, uh, which give us the insight into the. Uh, uh, likely monsoon next year. So we we are at it, and uh, we keep on doing. We like to collaborate with people in Australia and also a large number of uh, farming community in India. So this is what I wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Daga, for giving me a chance to speak. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Please share your number. We will definitely get back to you uh, on this and see how how we can collaborate together. So all of us are here for a common mission helping smallholder farmers to grow more cotton, more good quality cotton in dry land uh, India. Um, so, and uh, using the expertise and experience of, uh, you know, people from, from, from the Australian delegation as well as from India also. So uh, all of this together put in three webinars, how to increase the productivity of cotton, Australia, India cotton collaboration. We started with, uh, soil, then we went to seed. Now we have ended this webinar on weather. This is not the end of the journey. This is the beginning of the journey, my friends. How do we get started? How do we actually implement and execute what has been said in all these three webinars into a successful pilot, convert that into a scalable project so that every dry land across the world, may it be India, Africa, any other country, can use the Australian model and uh, be, be uh, a success for the cotton growing farmers so that we retain the cotton growing farmers, we ensure some better livelihood for all of them. So a uh, last word from you, uh, Dr. Richard, Dr. Adam, how the how did this webinar series go? What are your thoughts? How, do we, how did we get started and how do you feel right now? Oh, well, it's been, uh, it's been wonderful to um, you know, collaborate with you. And I think we will have Further discussions in uh, in a couple of weeks' time when we when we visit you, I think that's um, that'll be that'll be great a great opportunity. I think we're going to have uh, visits with um, people from the Ministry of Textiles and Better Cotton and yourselves and and um, you know we'll just look for those areas of collaboration. Um, I think it's also we've got to you know we've got to target where we believe we can make a real difference in helping you know because. We can, there's, there's so many topics, but we've got to say, you know, where, where is, if we put a little bit of effort, could we make a difference for our cotton producer colleagues in India? And so I think the the ability to come over and visit that um, that Dr. Nile has provided us, that's going to help us look at where, where can we make a difference? Because, you know, instead of talking about a production system that we haven't visited, we'll be visiting and talking with your farmers, talking with yourself, and, and we'll see where those opportunities are. So, you know, I just look forward to uh, to getting over there with our chairman and with um, Renee, who's a textile specialist, and uh, and I think we can we can take the discussions further then. Yes, we will definitely do that. Thanks, Dr. Richard. Thank you, Adam. I Thank think, I think um, Mr. Adams made those comments perfectly. I don't really have very much further to add other than being very happy to help facilitate this. I think this is going to hopefully be a, a mutually beneficial uh, initiative moving forward. Um, and with the with um with our free trade agreement in place and ongoing discussions for a broader one, um, we can look to to make sure we highlight the cooperation that we have between our sectors for a mutually beneficial outcome. So thank you, Mr. Manish. 
So here we are, the end of webinar series number three. And thank you, friends, for joining us for this webinar. Very interesting people from different backgrounds, scientists, uh, uh, spinning mills, uh, ginning factory owners, and also farmer producer organizations have been part of this webinar. A special thanks to Dr. Kavina Dayal for sparing your valuable time, sharing your insights and expertise on weather management, weather forecasting to protect, enhance, and uh, forecast uh, cotton agriculture and how you have been doing that in Australia. It's a very interesting journey. Thank you, Adam, from Cotton Australia for being part of this journey uh, throughout uh, the webinar and initiating uh, the thought that we had, how we can share more to learn more and grow together. Thank you, Dr. Richard from uh, Australia High Commission for also being part of this journey and very encouraging uh, person, always positive and never, uh, I mean, um, a single time he has denied whatever request we have made to him. So special thanks to you, Dr. Richard, and uh, a goodbye. And uh, in India, what we say is Shubh Mangal Kamna. Best wishes to all of you.